So the logic we had is that if I'm given if I'm given a large number of copies of the same entangled um, state, uh, then in, in this large limit, I can find a local unitary transformation, which is effectively Shannon's data compression. So I take a string which has unequal probabilities of zeros and ones and compress it into a string of the same num type, if you like, the same size, um, which basically contains zeros and ones with an equal probability. And if I do that locally, that's analogous or equivalent to making a global transformation from a state with less entanglement to a maximally entangled state. Then basically what happens is the argument says that because this is a unitary transformation, I'm really um, as efficient as possible. And what that means is that I've squeezed out as much entanglement as possible. In other words, the initial entanglement in this state is the same as the final entanglement in total, if you look at the, the total number. And that's, that's basically seen uh, by, by saying that n times, n times the initial entanglement, which is just, just this expression here, is the same as the final amount of entanglement n times the unit entanglement of each maximally entangled state. So entanglement is conserved in this game in the same way that entropy is conserved if you do things in a reversible way in, in any thermodynamical cycle. And that's the most efficient you can do in thermodynamics. Anything that's lossy and not reversible is going to give you a loss of ent entropy, in fact, an increase in the overall entropy of the universe. And I can say, what if I go backwards? That's another way of talking about irreversibility in thermodynamics. So I executed my process in one direction. Now I try to go back to the same state. But the state of the universe is no longer the same. That's another way of saying things are, in general, irreversible. Here, of course, because you are being as efficient as it's possible, you can do this in a fully reversible way. So if I do the opposite of sorry, the inverse, the u dagger, u to minus one of this transformation, I would have gone from these many maximally entangled states back into this state by local. So all I need to do is apply this. And we're done. So I never lose a single, a single entangled pair in this manipulation. And that's that you can see now that this is the equivalent of of, of the reversible thermodynamical cycle. And of course, we know that any reversible cycle in thermodynamics is as good as Carnot. So Carnot is just one possible cycle. Um, but there are probably X number of, uh, of, in particular, I guess, German thermodynamicists who came up with all sorts of other auto cycle and what, you know, all sorts of cars run on all sorts of cycles that came out of this 19th century uh, thermodynamical time. So basically, all of them are equally effective as long as you are reversible and you don't waste uh, anything else. Um, now I want to show you that if you go into the finite domain, of course the extreme of this is, is a single, single copy of an entangled state, then you can no longer use um, entropy as a reliable guide. Um, and, and so you still face the same, you still face the same, the same fact, namely that the best thing you, you should uh, strive to, to do, basically, in a way, is, is, is to be reversible. But if you have a finite number of copies, then you can never really do this kind of transformation unitarily for any two states. And the question is, how do I know which states can be converted into, into which other um, states? So I'll give you, I'll give you I'll give you the, the answer, so to speak, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the case of entanglement. And then I'll show you what the thermodynamics equivalent would be of that. And various people have worked out this, some of them even independently, completely unaware of, of one another. Um, and, and, and then I will, I will ask a question, because it will look a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and it will look as though the two Entanglement and entropy go in the opposite direction. So remember, um, in, in case of entropy, um, uh, the total entropy can only go up, or it can stay the same at, at best, if you like. 
Um, in case of entanglement, entanglement cannot go up under local operations. And so basically, LOCC, your entanglement in general will go down. And, and that's why I said the two, you know, the two laws sound very similar because they have the same kind of irreversibility built in. But in one case, I'm claiming that entropy goes up in terms of thermodynamics. In the other case, I'm claiming that entanglement, which is also quantified by entropy, is going down. So how come? You know, is, is this a contradiction? You know, am, am I violating the second law by using entangled states? And of course, the answer is I'm not. Uh, and and you, you will see where the subtlety is. But the finite case goes like this. So you can ask yourself, um, I start with some state, and I want to, but now I have a single copy of that state, just one. And I want to go by some LOCC to some other state. Um, and then the question is again, what is the best, uh, what is the best that, uh, that I can do? Um, and and, 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 and the answer is actually not that difficult, but you can very simply already see that there are states uh, which you cannot really convert into one another. And that's already the first surprise in the, in the, finite, in the finite case. So let me, just give you, let me just give you an example. If you start from a maximally entangled state, um, again, intuitively, the reason why I'm starting now from a maximally entangled state is because once I give you as much entanglement as possible, I should be able to go into lesser uh, entangled states uh, by some local operation. So intuitively, the best thing I, sh I should be able to do is really to start with something like uh, 1 over root 2, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then try by LOCC to go into something that has a different ratio of, of, uh, of probabilities for zeros and ones. And the question is, can I always do that? Can I do that with a unit probability? Um, I'm insisting on a unit probability simply because that's exactly what I was doing here. All the transformations are, are fully deterministic. They're unitary transformations. So the question is, can I do this? Um, and the answer will be yes, and there is one nice way of, of looking at, uh, at this thing, and I'll tell you about that before I give you the, the most general um, answer. Um, and then I will try to reconcile it with thermodynamics. Um, or in a way, I, can, I will tell you how to even understand finite thermodynamics once you understood finite uh, entanglement manipulations. It's really nice that it goes backwards now. So we are, we are teaching thermodynamics something, uh, coming from, from quantum information. Uh, so, you know, 10 years ago we were learning from them, now we are teaching them something. And I think it's always nice when it goes back and forth. Right? So basically what, uh, the, the, the simple answer to this is the following one. So going from here to here is always possible. I'm, I'm going to do it by construction. Simply because once Alice and Bob share a maximally entangled state like that, The easiest way of doing local operations and classical communication to share another state that's less entangled is simply for Alice, so remember everything on, on this side is Alice and everything on this side is Bob, is for Alice to make locally a two qubit state of this kind. So remember, locally she can do whatever she likes. She has access to as many qubits as possible. She can do whatever entangling operations she uh, she is able to do quantum mechanically here. So she makes a state like that locally of two qubits. And all she needs to do now is teleport this qubit to the other side using a maximally entangled state. And we know we can always teleport with unit efficiency whatever we like. So basically, I, I, prove, I don't want to, I think everyone here for sure can, 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 can recover teleportation in their sleep probably, so I'm gonna skip it, but basically, all she needs to do is a bell measurement in these two qubits. She will get one of the four outcomes. She picks up the phone and tells Bob which of the outcomes she got, upon which Bob rotates his qubit. And after that teleportation, what they will end up sharing is exactly the state A00 plus B11. So teleport. Okay, so make the state locally, teleport one half, that's it. You burnt one unit of entanglement, so this is of course a stupid thing to do in a way, but you have no other choice. What else can you do? 
and you, you, you get less in time than you, you, than you studied. So it's not something you probably want to be doing in practice, but it just shows you the, the game that you're able to play. And now you say, how about going backwards? And you can already see that you can't go backwards. And you can prove that formally as well. But going backwards would imply that you start from a, from a smaller amount of entanglement. But you can already see that if you swap these two states, if you try to teleport now, your fidelity of teleportation is never going to be <coughs> unit. It's going to be smaller because your state is no longer maximally entangled state that you're using to teleport. So there's no way that you can deterministically go from this state into that state by LOCC. So now it becomes irreversible. Even though the states are pure, I'm not talking about any mixed states at this stage, the whole thing in the finite case becomes, becomes irreversible. And that's precisely because the law of large numbers doesn't really apply. You need lots of copies of this guy, and then matching that subspace with lots of copies of this guy, and then you are fine with local operations. But you can't do it in a single case. Or, or, two, or any, any finite case has exactly the same the same problem. And so what you really discover, so this is another instance of this law, that entanglement can only go down by, by local operations. So, so in a way, if you have a state uh, that has lower amount of entanglement to start with, then you cannot increase this by local operations. This is what I was calling the, the, the second law analog in terms, of, in terms of entanglement. And then the question you ask is, so okay, so what, what is the, what, if, 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 if this is no longer sufficient in a way to, to achieve maximum efficiency, how shall I be characterizing all of these transformations? So entanglement is just one measure, this entropic entanglement. But it turns out that you have to consider infinitely many different entanglements. And then, if you satisfy all of them, you'll be fine. So let me tell you what, what this is. It's called Nielsen's criterion. <laughs> So the reason why I'm able to talk about it in terms of entropy is because of a beautiful paper by a guy whose name completely escapes me, but I can recover all of these things upon request, who actually proved um, that, that what, I, what, what I will present now as Nielsen's criteria is, is in fact equivalent to checking infinitely many different entropies. They're generalized entropies, so-called Rainy entropies. Um, and, and, and I will go into that a little bit as well in a, in a minute. So basically what Nielsen said is take your initial, take your initial state, um, and and I think in order to basically make it as general as possible, you can write the initial state um, in 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 some form like that. So take your initial entangled state. There are some amplitudes a n, and now I'm considering as many as many levels as as you like, and. And then he said, now I have a probability distribution associated with this, which, which of course is, is simply um, a n um, mod square. And now think about whether it's possible to find LOCC that gets you in, into some other uh, entangled state with some other amplitude. So of course, this results in, in the probability, in the reduced density matrix of, uh, of this kind of type. Um, and, and what Nielsen said um, is, is the, the, the formalism that applies in this case is something that's called majorization. So what you have to do is the following. You have to order these probabilities in a decreasing order. So start with the largest um, A, then the next one is whatever is the next one and so on, until you reach the smallest, the smallest probability. Order them in a, in a decreasing order. I don't know how to call it. Some kind of probability distribution. And, and this arrow indicates that, that the probabilities are going down, if you like. And then you do the same with this. Um, you order them in, in a decreasing order. So this is basically greater than or equal b2 and so on, okay, dn squared. And what you do now is you check so this, you will see how this has the spirit of, of entropy, but it actually goes beyond it. What you have to check now is whether um, A1 squared is less than or equal to B1 squared. So you compare the first two probabilities. Um, 
of these two. Then you test all the possible finite sums. So basically you take the first two largest ones and compare them with the next two largest ones. And so on, up until you do the full, of course the full, of, the full sum is just going to be unit because the probability is conserved. So the final, the final thing will be just an equality saying uh, one equals one. So basically I take all the sub sums and if for each of these the inequality goes in exactly the same direction so the B sums are always bigger than the A sums then we say that the, that, that the um, this distribution B majorizes the distribution A so this is a mathematical definition so basically if you if you call this, I called it already P and Q distribution. So in this case, you would say that, uh, that the Q distribution um, is, in fact, there's a, there's a curly sign that people usually use, which simply just reflects that all of these sums are satisfied simultaneously, that this Q distribution uh, majorizes the P distribution. Um, and, and let me let me let me give you let, so of course we can go now back so what what Nielsen stated is once you impose this majorization then you can only go in one direction this now acts <coughs> a little bit like the entropy what this says is that the mixedness of this probability distribution is bigger than the mixedness of that so I'm gonna I'm gonna revert back to physical intuitive language because otherwise if I keep writing inequalities no one is going to understand anything and even I'm going to get confused with all of this sign so this says uh, P is more mixed but now I'm being far stricter I don't mean mixed in terms of the entropy of P is bigger than ent entropy of P really is bigger than entropy of Q but not only is the entropy bigger all of these other sub-entropies are also simultaneously bigger. So this is a stronger condition than entropy. This implies entropy, but it's not implied by entropy. It's, it's a more general condition. So basically this says P is more mixed than Q. And now you can see what the statement will be of, of this criterion. So the question is, when can I convert one entangled state into another one? And you can only do that if the initial probability distribution is more mixed than the final probability distribution. That means that this state is more entangled than that state. So if I start, remember our example, half, <coughs> one half zero zero one one. If you look at if you look at the probabilities here, they are basically one half one half, and this is as mixed as it gets for a qubit. You can't have a more mixed state than, than an equal mixture. And the other, the other state I, I, I wanted to reach, and I showed you how to do that, is simply something that has different amplitudes for, for 0, 0, and 1, 1. So this is something whose probability distribution looks like that. So in terms of majorization, A squared is, is uh, uh, bigger than a half because I'm assuming that they go down in a decreasing order. So I'm ordering them in the way that, that this is obeyed. So basically, A squared is gonna be bigger than a half. And of course, A squared plus B squared is trivially equal to a half plus a half. So there only really, there's only really one uh, inequality to check in this case. But what this says is that this probability distribution is more mixed than that probability distribution. And that's the direction of local operations. You cannot go the other way around. You cannot go from a, from a state with, with less to more mixture. And, and now you can already see that, that it feels as though I'm going in the wrong direction. I mean, what I'm claiming now is that I go from a state which has higher amount of mixedness, higher entropy, if you like, to a state with lower entropy. Isn't that the opposite of the, of the second law of thermodynamics? Doesn't it look like I'm actually reducing entropy um, when, when I want to convert one entangled state into another state? So you see something that, that at this level looks like this. If you look at the reduced state of row A, I have a half 
zero and half one. And what I did when I converted it into the reduced state of the final state, call it rho a prime, is I've got a squared zero plus b squared one. And this guy is less mixed than, than the first guy. So the entropy has gone down. And I argue that this makes sense because if you think of entropy as entanglement, then entanglement can only go down under local operations. But how do I square this with the fact that entropy can only go up? I mean, am I not doing something wrong thermodynamically speaking? You see how you could be led to believe that entanglement in a way contradicts um, the second law. But it doesn't really. Um, and, and so the most general statement here is you can convert one state into another state <coughs> if and only if this one of these states the probability distribution derived from one of them majorizes the other probability. If that doesn't happen to be the case, then you can never execute this transformation. So it's far stronger. You don't just check the entropy; you check all of these, all of these, um, all of these inequalities. And okay, now I'll, I'll tell you. I mentioned this result that uh, that came up uh, within the last few years um, because. You know, when you write things down in terms of probabilities and inequalities, it doesn't look really physical and intuitive. And I want to write this as a bunch of entropies. And for a long time, people came up, there's a guy called Salis, I think, who's got his own infinitely many generalized entropies. And every person almost has their own generalized entropy because it's trivial to make one. Um, and, and at some stage, this game proliferated, and there were lots of papers written on that. But physicists basically started to ask the question, does it make sense to generalize entropies? Like, why are you doing that? What exactly does this explain? It, does it correspond to anything physical? And interestingly enough, it does. Uh, because when you go into the, into the finite case, these are exactly the entropies you have, to, you have to check. So the statement goes like this. I have to take, I will define this in a minute. I have to take the Rényi entropy of the order alpha of one of these probability distributions. Let's call it P. And I have to check whether that entropy is bigger than or equal to the same entropy of the same order of the other probability distribution. If this is true for all alpha, that statement is equivalent to majorization. Okay? So this is just a mathematical statement. It contains no physics. But I like it better because it's phrased in terms of entropy. It says you should not just be checking Shannon entropy, you should check infinitely many other entropies. Only one of these guys is Shannon entropy. But you have to check them all between zero and infinity, if you like. So let me define, let me define this Rényi, Rényi entropy. So Rényi introduced, it, introduced this concept as, as, a, as an information theorist. He couldn't care less whether there was any physics behind this. And people couldn't care less about this up until very recently. When, when a few of us started to ask this question, you know, is there any thermodynamics behind these rainy entries? And there is. Um, so now I'm still sticking to entanglement. So what this says is I'm checking different degrees of mixedness. And if for every degree of mixedness, one probability distribution is more mixed than the other one, then that's it. That's necessary and sufficient to be able to find a local operation in classical communication to go from one state to the other state. So these Rényi entropies look something like this. Log sum P, so I'm going to define it just for probability P, okay? Log of P um, n <coughs> to the power of alpha divided by 1 minus alpha, or log alpha minus 1. I might be missing a minus. So, so this quantity, so what you're doing if, if alpha tends to 1, um, what happens is that, is that S alpha goes into the usual Shannon entropy, the P log P1, the typical one. It's not obvious to see that, okay, but then you just have to expand to the first order and, and, and the things will come up. For higher order alphas, oh, by the way, if you take alpha 0, that means all of these probabilities which might be different, they all give you the same 
probability because you're raising them to the power of zero, which gives you one. So the meaning of alpha zero is even though you might have a probability distribution that looks like that in the decreasing order, so basically here is the value of your probability, and this is one, two, up to n. Even though there is a probability distribution there that's uneven, if I take the zero entropy, all I'm doing is looking at them uh, on an equal footing. I'm making them all equal. For alpha going to infinity, that's the other extreme. I'm raising these probabilities to higher and higher power, and in that limit, only the largest probability will survive. All the smaller ones will basically become relatively smaller and smaller. And so basically, in the, in the, in the limit of alpha going to infinity, all I'm basically doing is taking, so S of infinity is the log of the probability P1, which is the highest probability in my sequence. There is a minus sign there. So basically, one extreme of these entropies says I'm looking at all the probabilities equal. The other one says I'm only going to look at the maximum probability. And now you can see why the many entropies are the same. At least you can see intuitively. You still have to prove it and write the friendly page on the logical table. But basically, you can see why alpha infinity compares the biggest uh, eigenvalues. The next one down compares this one and so on, all the way to making the full sum of all the probabilities. That's your alpha norm. Yeah. And if all of these entropies go in one order, saying that one probability distribution is, is more mixed than the other one, then that's equivalent to being able to locally convert this state and this distribution into, into that state. So now, now you say, OK, that's great. What is your measure of entanglement now? There are infinitely many entropies that you have to take into account. It's not as neat as, as, the, as the infinite case. Okay? And the interesting thing is if you now take many copies of the same probability distribution, all of these entropies tend exactly to Shannon entropy in the limit <coughs> of n tending to infinity. So now I'm giving you the most general finite case, and I'm even telling you that formally, if you take n to infinity, all of these inequalities just go into a single inequality, which is alpha equals 1. And that's, again, because of the law of large numbers. So it's all nice and consistent. So in the finite case, I need to compare infinite and many things. In the, in the infinite case, I, I recover the, the, previous, uh, the previous result. So this is great. Now, um, and that characterizes finite manipulations once and for all, because it goes in both directions. It's necessary and sufficient. So this is if and only if and only you state. Um, notice, and I'm going to make this comment for entanglement just because I want to make it in terms of, in terms of entropies as well, uh, in thermodynamics. Notice that, um, that it could easily happen that the entropy itself is misleading in this case. So you could, you could have the entropy of one state bigger than the other one, and yet you cannot really make any transformation. And that's precisely because this is not uh, sufficient in this case, and it's not even necessary. So you can even violate the other, the other direction. So let me let me now show you how how this finite. Um, I'm sorry. As soon as you go into the finite domain, you therefore get something that's fundamentally irreversible. So re reversibility is only recovered in the thermodynamic limit. You can never get reversible transformations in the in the finite domain for entanglement. And now I'm going to show you it's the same for thermodynamics. So some people might say that because we always manipulate a finite number of subsystems, we actually never do things reversibly in this universe. That's the key. I, I, I tend to disagree with this statement, but I'm trying to sell it as best as I can do. That's the key to the entropy increase in the universe, the finiteness of anything we do. It's a possible candidate for explaining the error uh, um, so basically, so basically, in thermodynamics, let me tell you how finite um, thermodynamics is phrased, and it will end up looking more or less like what we did for entanglement, and that's the beauty of that. So you're starting with some state of your system. I'm going to make the 
I think, like I said, there are many different formulations of this. And as soon as you discuss this, some people say, oh, maybe you should make certain other assumptions. I'm going to make the least number of assumptions <coughs> as far as I'm concerned. And you can't make this simpler than what I'm now saying. And I think everything else that you can talk about in thermodynamics follows from something of this kind. So finite, because I'm going to take a single copy of my system, or a finite number of copies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be given the initial state of my system, and I'm going to be given the Hamiltonian of my system. That's given. Um, and what I want to do is I want to extract as much, as much work as possible out of my system. That's how this is phrased. So previously, we wanted to get as much entanglement as possible. And we were asking, from which state could I go to which other state? Here I'm saying the same question. But what I'm optimizing is work. I'm not optimizing entanglement. And interestingly enough, I'll get more or less the same answer. And that's really interesting. I mean, you know, it shows you that the two are equivalent even at the finite level. So basically what you do now is ideally you want to make some kind of unitary transformation. So let's say you, you vary this Hamiltonian for a certain amount of time from zero to tau. And you end up, you end up at the end with a closed uh, cycle. So just like kind of cycle. I change the Hamiltonian. And at the end, at time tau, I come back to the initial Hamiltonian. And the question I'm going to ask is, is, what is the best final state for me to, uh, for me to, um, to get as much work as possible out of that? And now you can ask, of course, how do, you, how do you define the amount of work in quantum mechanics? And the work is simply defined as, as the energy difference the average energy difference in the initial and the final state. Because I'm doing things unitarily, it's a closed system. It's something that's called an adiabatic transformation. That means that delta Q is equal to zero. There's no heat exchange between my system rho and the environment. And that means the first law tells me that delta work is the same as the change in the internal energy. So this is the first law of thermodynamics. And so the way I'm going to define, now I know how to define these things quantum mechanically. The initial energy is trace of rho times the Hamiltonian. And the final energy is trace, probably I should call this rho naught, just to emphasize the, the initial state. And the final state, of course, it's the same Hamiltonian. I'm talking about the same system. I may have some other Hamiltonian in between. I switch on another Hamiltonian to drive the system, but then I switch it off and I go back to the same Hamiltonian. And the question is, when is this difference maximal? I want to maximize the amount of work given a fixed set of initial. And, and I'll give you the answer. And that's really interesting. I'll give you the answer that's only correct and I think you're guessing already what I, what I have to say. It's only correct in the thermodynamic limit. And then I'll tell you what are the criteria if you have a finite uh, number of these guys. And it's going to end up being majorization, <coughs> the same as, as previously. So basically, the statement I want to now make is that if you have real finite <coughs> thermodynamics, as you do in, in any manipulation you can imagine, you should not be talking about entropy increase in your universe, you should be talking about all Rényi entropies, or majorization, in other words. So, so under ideal circumstances, you can show, I think this is a really nice exercise if you, if you can be bothered to go through this, you can show that the best final state is basically e to minus beta, beta being 1 over kT, um, h, H is the Hamiltonian, so that's the Gibbs state, divided by the, you know, the partition. So Z is, as always, trace of E to the minus theta H. So a Gibbs state, a thermal state, is the best state for you to, to achieve this transformation. And now you can say, wait a second, I mean, didn't you just tell me that you have an isolated 
physical system in any state rho naught. So where, is, where does KT come from? Where's the temperature? Where's your environment? There isn't any environment. So I'm only writing it in this way because I know that Gibbs states are the most effective ones. But this beta is a parameter that you now have to derive. So it's not your temperature, it's kind of a fictitious effective temperature, but it's not really the physical temperature, kinetic energy, you know, things colliding and so on. Um, so how do you get beta? And, and the argument is now probably going to be very familiar to you already. The best transformation from A to B is the one that preserves entropy of your state. It's the most efficient that you can be in terms of work. And what that means is that the entropy of the initial state should be, in, in, in general, of course, the entropy of the final state will be higher because that's the second law of thermodynamics. But if you can achieve that the initial state and the final state are isentropic, that fixes your beta. Because, because the Hamiltonian is given to you, rho naught is given to you, and this gives you beta max, if you like, or beta star, the optimum beta to which you have to drive your system in order to get the maximum amount of work. That's it. That's your answer. So I'm given a state, I couldn't care less. That's why I said this was the minimal formulation, because it's really how we do experiments in quantum information. You have a single ion in an ion trap sitting in whatever state I care to prepare. It doesn't have to be thermodynamical Gibbs state at all because the whole point of quantum computing is that we are far away from, from thermal equilibrium. There is no thermal equilibrium in physics anymore because we are better than nature. You, know, you can stay away from that. So the right question to ask is, let's forget thermal reservoirs and all the nonsense. Like, if you like, this rho naught could be rho of your system times some thermal state. You see why this is even more general? This includes anything you care to add to it. You can think of this as infinitely big as well. You can recover the full thermodynamics for that, no problem. But you can't go backwards. But this is more fundamental than anything else you can ask. And now, of course, you say, oh, but that's really nice. So entropy still gives me the answer. The most efficient amount of work, here is the formula, is simply the one that preserves the entropy. But in the finite case, I cannot find the unitary transformation that preserves entropy because it's a finite, it's a, fi it's a single qubit, for example. And it's exactly the same logic as in terms of entanglement manipulations. It would be great to have this, but most frequently, you cannot really find U such that the initial and the final states are connected by this unitary transformation. And so, all I'm really saying again is the same lesson. It's not sufficient to look at the entropy. You have to look at more than that. And let me give you the answer. So it's really nice somehow because you're starting to get the same, the same logic uh, emerging from, from finite thermodynamics that we saw operate in Nielsen's criterion for, for finite entanglement. And that's really nice. It's all, you know, it's just logically consistent. The whole structure is, is, is okay. Um, so let me let me let me just show you that, and I think then then we then we take a break um, and and come back to discuss questions of irreversibility and so on. Um, so basically, um, yeah. So what, what is you know if if I want to really execute a unitary transformation, and that's what I'm that's what I'm saying is the most effective way of doing things. Then a unitary transformation, um, so I want to go from some state rho to some state sigma. Then you know that any unitary transformation is not just going to preserve entropy of the whole state, but it's going to preserve all the eigenvalues of the initial state as well. And that's much stronger, because entropy is just a combination of eigenvalues, rho log rho. This one says every eigenvalue has to stay the same. So hence nature is, that's why you have to look at the sum of all possible eigenvalues. Um, so I, it's just very simple to see that. If you, if you write rho in some, let's, let's call this the, the eigen, 
the eigen decomposition of state growth. So these are the eigen eigen states, and these are the eigen eigenvalues of, of your initial state. So these R's are just probabilities. If I do a unitary transformation on this state, all I'm effectively executing is a rotation. So R's stay the same, they're numbers. All I'm doing is making a transformation um, of the of the eigenvectors. So I'm rotating the spectrum, and I'm preserving all the eigenvalues. This was exactly at, at play when we looked at typical such places as one. So basically, all I'm doing is changing this maybe into some other state, SK, another orthogonal set. But I'm not touching these R's here. But so that implies the whole spectrum is unchanged, not just the entropy of that, of that spectrum. Um, so all the rainy entropies are the same, in other words, if you, if you go back to that, uh, to that kind of logic. Um, and so now you, now you ask yourself, okay, so what's the best I can do to get the maximum amount of, of work? Um, and and, and the, best, the best you can do is to take, so basically your Hamiltonian, is given of the system, and let's call it something like energy is E k, and then some set of um, eigen states of your initial Hamiltonian. So this this Hamiltonian, as well as your input state rho, is given in this problem. And given that you know this spectrum here, what you should do, and it's a kind of intuitively clear that this is the best you can do, you should rotate these R's into the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in such a way that the highest probability here corresponds to the lowest energy. The next highest probability corresponds to the next energy level up, and so on. And that way, I'm going into the minimum amount. I shove as much probability into the ground state. That would be the best. I'm going from certain energy to zero energy. But I can't go to zero energy because I can't change the probabilities here. The best I can do is take the maximum probability, shove it into the lowest energy, the next one up, into the next energy up, and so on. And that happens to be actually the best, the best case scenario. So these S's into which you should be rotating are really the eigen energies of your, of your system. And that happens to be the best amount of, the best amount of, of work that, uh, that you can get. Uh, for this uh, for this system. Um, so um, and now so so the whole point of this now is 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 to make the following statement. And this is going to be now the analog of the of the second law of thermodynamics in the finite case. So the question is the following: I'm given two states. So I'm given something like row one and row two and they have the same Hamiltonian H. Um, so I want to, I want to, uh, I want to basically uh, do that in order to compare them on an equal footing. So now they have a certain initial energy which is trace of row 1H and trace of row 2H. And what we are asking now is which of these two states is going to give me more work um, in the in, in this kind of setting. So I'm allowed to unitarily, if you like, change each of these two states into some other state. And then I look at the difference between the energies, the initial energies and the final energies. And then I ask which of these two states gives me more work. So if I, you know, I want to know that whether the work of row one is bigger than or less than the work of row two. <coughs> in the thermodynamic limit, there is only one answer to that. A more mixed state will give you less work. It's as simple as that. If you have higher entropy, you're closer to thermal equilibrium, and that's going to give you less work. Something more mixed gives you less work. And there's only one meaning of mixedness in, in, in infinite thermodynamics. But here, this is no longer the case. And the punchline, of course, is what you have to do is compare majorization of both of these probability distributions. And the statement goes like this. If one state majorizes the other, so that means if the eigen, so now I'm going to have eigenvalues of 
for this guy, RK1, meaning subsystem 1, in state 1, and then RK2. And if you now compare and, and, and look at majorization between these two, then the statement is like this. If one of these majorizes the other one, which means the other state is more mixed than this one, that goes in the opposite direction, then basically the less mixed state will give you more work than the more mixed state. So if you have something like that, that means that the work due to coming out of row one, if you like, is always bigger than or equal to work out of row two. But it's no longer enough to check the entropy. You have to check all the many entropies for, for infinitely many alphas, if you like. So that's really the interesting, the interesting state. Um, and, and I said that people in our field started to phrase things like this maybe some, some five or six years ago. So you can read quite a few papers um, by, by, by various authors on, on this. However, it was, I found it surprising that, that a couple of chemists came up with, this is why I guess we were not aware of this work for a long time, because who reads chemistry papers after all? A couple of chemists, I, get, I, I really suspect that secretly these guys were theoretical physicists. And as you know, a physicist can get a job anywhere else. You know, computing, chemistry, they all full of physics. Uh, engineering in particular. Half of every engineering is physics. The better half. So basically, um, what this chemist said is, is the, the, the title of the paper is Grand in the sense something like the new uh, the new uh, version of the second law of thermodynamics. And they make exactly this point. They say that if we deal with a finite number of copies uh, and try to convert one finite number into another one, we should really not be using the entropy. And it's not a reliable guide. We have to be using majorization as, as the right criteria. So this was already, I think, 75, 76. There was a full formulation of finite thermodynamics. And the punchline is, 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 is this one. The two can actually contradict one another. So what can happen is the following. What can happen is that the usual entropy, so the Shannon entropy, if you like, of one system is bigger, strictly bigger, than the entropy of the other system. If this was true, if this was in the thermodynamical setting, this would immediately imply, if n tends to infinity, if you like, this would immediately imply that the work uh, that you can get out of row one is less than or equal to the work that you can get out of row, of row two. But the interesting thing is that in the finite case, this is no longer true. You can find these examples where entropy says that one state is more mixed than the other one, but actually you can get more work out of that more mixed state. And that really seems to flatly contradict the second law. And it's not true that it contradicts it. It, it goes into it in the infinite n limit. Again, it's the, same, it's the same logic. But in the finite case, you have to be very careful. So this example shows you that you cannot conclude just from one parameter that one thing is more mixed than, than the other one. You have to check a range of, of, infinitely, of infinitely many parameters. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because I think it's been, it's been long enough. And, um, and when we come back, um, I, so, so basically I will summarize the whole thing when we come back. It's a very simple picture. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll discuss some of these fundamental consequences. In particular, I mentioned re irreversibility that comes out of entanglement and out of standard thermodynamics. Are they the same kind of irreversibility? How do we understand that? And then I want to show you another formulation of the second law, which is not probably known to, to, to most physicists because it's highly mathematical. But I want to ask this question of, can thermodynamics possibly be a reliable guide for us when we go beyond quantum mechanics? I mean, you know, this is, I think I'm going to speak about this just for fun because we all know full well that there is not a single experiment telling us that we should go beyond quantum mechanics. I mean, quantum mechanics is depressingly accurate. There is no violation of quantum mechanics anywhere in this universe. And that's how depressing it is. And, and the only, so now we have to play all these fancy games, which people call generalized probabilistic theories or anything. I think you will hear a lot about it tomorrow from those techniques. 
But basically, given that we have no guidance from experiments, we have to come up with all these ideas ourselves. And they're useful ideas because they give us a glimpse of something that might come next. And they also tell us how this something is different to what we already know in quantum mechanics. But now I want to use some kind of thermodynamical logic to say maybe thermodynamics can even guide us come up with, a, with, a, with the ultimate theory. I think it's a really interesting idea. But that, uh, probably I'll spend the last 20 minutes of the, of the last lecture on that. And, and so when the clock starts ticking, the last 20 minutes, just be very skeptical of everything I had to say at that point, because it's highly speculative. There is no foundation to that. But I'm just telling you this for fun, since I find it extremely, extremely interesting. Let's make a break, and we will be coming in at 7 o'clock.